it's uh, it's not often uh, that we have a, a head of state here at, at, at Politics and Prose. In fact, it's pretty rare. Um, and at the moment, it's still pretty rare because she's not with us yet. Uh, <laughs> but she's on her way with um, an escort, so she should be here shortly, and we thought we should just get underway. Um, but, but, we, but we will feel very privileged when she's here to welcome uh, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf of, of Liberia. You know, it was just over a, a decade ago in 2005 that President Sirleaf became the f first woman um, in, um, in modern African history to be elected uh, head of state. Uh, and she's widely credited with ushering uh, her country into a stable peace after years of, of brutal civil war. Uh, educated in the United States, including a master's degree from, from Harvard, President Sirleaf uh, was in and out of her native country several times earlier in her career as a result of the political upheavals there. She was Minister of Finance when Samuel Doe seized power in 1980, uh, and within a few months she went into exile and into what uh, turned out to be, over the years, a series of international banking or development positions with the World Bank, Citibank, HSBC, and the United Nations. Returning to Liberia in 1985, she ran for a Senate seat, but after speaking out against Doe's military regime, she landed in jail and again fled the country. Back once more a decade later, she ran un unsuccessfully for president against uh, the warlord Charles Taylor, uh, then again went into exile with the transition to democracy and the general elections of 2005. She ran a second time for president and won in a runoff. Uh, taking charge of a nation shattered by years of civil strife and grappling with burdens of widespread poverty. She was reelected in 2011, the same year that she shared the Nobel Peace Prize with two other courageous women, all recognized uh, for their, quote, nonviolent struggle for the safety of women and for women's rights to full participation in peace building work. Uh, her story is told in the new book. Uh, Choosing the Hero by Reva Levinson, uh, who's also uh, a featured guest here this afternoon, and I'm happy to say is actually here at the moment, um, as, as head of, uh, of KRL International, a communications and government relations firm. Reva represents Liberian interests and has served as a, as a longtime advisor to President Sirleaf. Reva's career as a strategist on international issues uh, began three decades ago after she talked her way into a job at a political public relations firm founded by, among others, Paul Manafort. Yes, that Paul Manafort. Uh, at that initial interview, as Reva recounts in her book, she told Manafort there's no place in the world she wouldn't go, and she's been globetrotting ever since. Uh, she's been involved in a number of complex and ses sensitive projects around the world, but much of her work ha has focused uh, on Africa. In choosing the hero, she weaves her story together with President Sirleaf's and offers an instructive tale of an international friendship uh, and achievement. Uh, 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 by the way, uh, I'd like to note that also uh, here today is Joyce Banda, the former president uh, of Malawi. Uh, and Jeremiah Salunte, uh, Liberia's ambassador uh, to the United States. And uh, now, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Reva Levinson. Good afternoon. Great crowd. Thank you for being here. Um, Madam President is about five to ten minutes out, so we're going to have to be a bit flexible. I'm going to start and stop, and so we'll, we'll, we'll uh, move that way. Um, I wanted to say that it's an honor to be here today, introduced by Brad Graham and eventually alongside Madam President with my American family and uh, my Liberian family and in the company of so many friends and colleagues who I've worked with over nearly two decades in support of the people of Liberia and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Um, special thanks to my husband, Jeff, and my daughter, Kylie, and my son, Andrew. You guys are everything to me. 
and also to my work family, KRL International, and to the remarkable team that uh, brought my book to life. There are so many reasons I wanted to write this book, but um, here today, for the sake of time, as we're running 30 minutes late, I'm going to focus on um, three. Uh, the first one is that um, I think, as Brad said, that I've uh, spent nearly three decades traveling the world to some of its most inhospitable places, often in times of conflict, Somalia, Angola, Iraq, and Liberia. These were the front lines of history, and I bore witness. And many of the people who I had come to know and to befriend did not live to fight another day. And I needed to make sense of it all. How would my work be judged and by whom? So this book helps make sense of it all. Um, second, I wanted the world to know Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who hopefully you'll know soon, uh, not as Madam President or as the first woman elected to lead an African nation, not as the Presidential Medal of Freedom winner or the Nobel Laureate, but the person underneath all of those titles, underneath all of those accolades, to know her humanity, to meet the grandmother, to meet the mom, the sister, the aunt, the friend, the woman who I came to work with in February of 1997 when everything was lined up against her, her own countrymen, the African regional players, the international community, and yes, the U.S. government was against her as well. Even her own family, who um, will be coming in with her, including her grandchildren, had hoped she would relent because rightfully they feared for her safety. But she was seized with her mission in life, her calling to bring peace to her country, Liberia. She was willing to fight no matter the cost, no matter the consequence. I had hoped Madam was going to be here because I'm going to say that this woman is not perfect. <laughs> she makes mistakes. She has regrets. But she has been utterly consistent her whole life. It has always been the well-being of the Liberian people that she desired most, their future, and their promise that she sought to advance. I met Ellen Johnson Sirleaf when she was determined to return home from exile um, to her native Liberia to challenge the rule of warlords. She was looking for someone to fight for her in Washington, DC. I met Ellen at a time when I doubted almost everything about my life's choices. And again, I think Brad shared with you how I started um, with a political consulting firm back in uh, 1985. So it was uh, Ellen's faith in me that restored my belief in myself. Final reason, well, final of three I'm going to share. There's so many more reasons. I wanted to uh, demystify Washington, DC, to draw back the curtain to show how things really get done, to demonstrate the importance of American leadership in the world and what happens when we get it right, and to shout out to those who I credit for much of Liberia's post-conflict success, which is select members of Congress and their staff. So um, timing, is she on her way? No? She's here. Well, the ambassador went back. Went back. Uh, All right. <laughs> OK. Her, her motorcade's here. Do you want me to do the reading, or should I wait? She's here? Ah, OK. I'm going to wait. No? I'm going to wait. <laughs> Who's read the book? <laughs> Somebody say something. <laughs> President Banda. I'm ad-libbing here, sorry. <laughs> oh, she's coming? Ah, she's coming. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. 
No, no, here, here for now. Madam, you missed my introduction to the book. <laughs> Anyone want to summarize it? <laughs> so I'm just going to, I'm going to do a reading now. Um, I'll, uh, I'll share with you. I wanted to make you, you cry. <laughs> so I'm going to um, do a reading from the book. It's uh, the close of the second chapter. And then uh, we'll reverse and ask Madam President to come up. So um, the, the uh, year is um, 1996, July. And I've just met Madam President for the first time. She was serving as the head of the UNDP for Africa. She sat over the entire program and budget for the African continent. And I've just met her. And this is my thoughts. So how did I get here, trying to sell Teodoro Obiang to Ellen Johnson Sirleaf? On that summer afternoon in New York City in 1996, I have the overwhelming sense of being at a personal crossroads. It's time to stop and examine what I'm doing and why. I need to put everything on the table and take a brutally honest look at my life. What difference had I really made? What lasting good had I done? What would Oma say if she were standing here before me? I wish with all my heart she was. Would she think I was adrift? Would she reassure me that all of this is life's journey and that I'm accumulating experiences and lessons that will be applied with meaning one day? Would she think my trial so trivial given the decisions she had to grapple with in her, in her lifetime coming from Berlin? I am sure of a few things. I know to be right, I know to be good. My husband, Jeff, my infant daughter, Kylie, my unshakable belief that there are people in the world dedicated to doing others and that I want to be one of them. And this, a new thought that is just beginning to take route and grow. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf will make history. She will change the world. I don't know how she will do it. I don't know what it will entail, but I know I want to help her. I want to come along in that journey. I want to work for Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. That's my Wow. Good afternoon to all. Uh, when Riva told me she was going to write a book, I, my first reaction was, why do you want to do that? He said, well, there's so much to be told. And, and I want to be able to share some of these experiences with, with the world. All right, <laughs> go to it. And then I got the first draft, out of courtesy. And, and then I called Riva, I said, are you sure you want to write a book? <laughs> you sure you want to say the things you're saying? Uh, you sure you want to disclose confidences? Uh, but she said, you know, this is my story. And in a way, this is your story. Uh, and we think it ought to be told. And besides, there are lots of things in this road that I've traveled that people ought to know, the good sides, the bad sides, the, the thrills one gets from being following development work, and also the agony that one faces from time to time when you run into obstacles. And so um, she did a little bit of tweaking here and there and a little bit of changes here and there. And, and the, book, um, the book is a wonderful book. It, it, tells, it tells a story of Riva, uh, some of the daring things that she did. It tells a story of courage 
the courage to to go into uncharted waters and and to be able to to come out of it and to succeed and to have your goal accomplished uh, somewhere along the way of course because of her her commitment to to work with me it it uh, tells the story of of tells my story in a way and and that too has the hills and valleys <laughs> the good times and the bad times it's so it's it's been a long road and let me say that there are quite a few people in this room that that could write similarly because they too have been on that road with me <laughs> and I can see many of them in the room that have shared those those difficult days and those good days and leading us to to where we are. Uh, I think one has to has to give a lot of credit uh, to Reva for doing this book. Uh, in the midst of all the many things she was doing, she was although <coughs> although the difficult part was over and she could she could tell a story that came that came that ended in success success you know with my uh, with my election success with with my taking on the task of joining others to rebuild my country uh, but still she continued while doing that uh, to be a part of what we're trying to do of trying to reconstruct our country of trying to rebuild anew something that's been so badly destroyed and she's been, she's always been there with us. Um, I sometimes think that uh, Riva knows the country as well as I do, uh, because she's always probing and finding out and questioning and talking and, uh, and sharing with people some of her own ideas. And so she's truly a part also of Liberia's own uh, renewal and what she's contributed through the support that she's given me for us to achieve uh, what we what we have so to all of you who are here to be able to to share in this I I think you ought to read the book uh, you know and that's that's the that's the end game right <laughs> the end game is to walk up to that shelf and buy a copy of the book and read it <laughs> And so I hope each and everyone in here will participate in that, in that end game because that's all. The effort is not only to write the book, but also to share it and to have some people read it. And maybe, maybe after reading it, you know, you might either one want to write your own experiences. Could be just just as interesting, just as captivating. Or you could be and courage to start a journey of your own. A journey on identifying somewhere along the road something that you want to achieve and begin to pursue that, uh, leading someday to being able to share your experiences after you've reached the goal that you've set, that you've set up uh, to achieve. I could recognize quite a few people uh, people in this room. I mean, Joyce comes first. I know Joyce is writing, is working on her. Oh, aren't you, Joyce? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> We're waiting for that one, too. <laughs> uh, I know that uh, there's so many others here that that have been part of that, and I, I want to say to all of you that contributed to what we've achieved uh, in Liberia that uh, it's because you have been there. It's because you've been able, if not, if not directly, certainly indirectly, uh, through the organizations in which you are part of, through the support that comes through your own government, uh, through so many ways, through the universities that we've had an opportunity to, to be able to speak to, uh, to be able to read from, to work with them. All of that has made our story uh, the success story that it is. And so 
I want to thank all of you all for being here and for being a part of it. I'm quite sure we're going to uh, get to the second start of the show, and that's when we'll really begin to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> As we as we begin to have the interaction and and begin to listen to your side of your side of uh, of the story, your comments, your views, uh, your questions, sharing with us some of the the same kinds of experiences that each of you, I'm sure, have had as you look forward to carrying on on your road. Thank you for being here. So uh, I think we're going to take questions, and uh, everybody lines up at that microphone right there. But um, before I take the first question, because uh, Madam President was uh, not here for my opening, I just want to take the liberty of reading the, um, a paragraph from the afterword of my book, which helps people understand what the meaning of the title is. And so if you'll bear with me, it's just a single paragraph, and I'm going to read it. So, um, working with Ellen has taught me to follow my heart and to not fear being misunderstood. I have come to see that certainty is a luxury and destiny a journey that reveals itself with time. It's easy to stray off course, to doubt and to lose faith, to seek compromise as surrender, to feel judged, to feel isolated, even abandoned. But there's always something to hold on to, the belief that things will get better. I've come to appreciate that we need people to guide us, those we admire, those we believe in, the heroes that we choose. So. Thank you. <laughs> so it's just the questions? So questions. B Madam President. Madam President and uh, Riva, um, it's my privilege to be here. I read the book <laughs> <laughs> before it was even printed. And I went through line by line. But um, first, let me congratulate you for writing this book. And second, may I be allowed to say I was amazed at how the two of you found one another, and how you provided support to the president throughout her journey, through thick and thin. I say this because I've been there, and I know how critical it is for you to have somebody that you can bounce with, you, that you can call any time of the day and any time of the night. And especially if you're in Africa, and that person is here in America, I want to thank you on her behalf, and I want to thank Madam President, for allowing her to let us see through your journey. But the question I had was, uh, take us through Iraq. I mean, what, <laughs> what took you to Iraq? I mean, you got there, and you were not well. And you ask yourself in here, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. Just take us through that. That's the one, one chapter that I read again and again, because I was trying to understand <laughs> how you left your dear husband behind and children and found yourself on the streets in Iraq. Thank you. Uh, thank you. F I think I'll take that question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Madam President, thank you. And also thank you for the inspiration that, uh, that you pro provided. Madam President read my book, and she was in London. And she like sends me a text. She's like, Somalia, I totally don't get it. I was like laughing the whole time. Why is this relevant? So um, and then Iraq, she didn't get that one either. But it's part of my story. So it's part of Madam President's story through my eyes. But and I think I have a couple of uh, friends here from, um, you know, from Iraq, including Fa Francis Brooke, who came through as well. But kind of long story short, um, I was a State Department contractor to the Iraqi National Congress. I was hired by Madeleine Albright in 1999, and I thought it would be a really 
easy assignment. I'd go back and forth. The, the Iraqis were in exile in, in London, you know, writing press releases, talking about Saddam's crimes. And then 9-11 happened, and then George Bush happened, and then the INC went into Baghdad, and I felt that that was my place. They needed to go and they needed to set up their communication operation. And so one of the most fun and ridiculous chapters of my book, just when you think we're gonna stay on the African continent, is uh, my convoy into Baghdad from Kuwait City. And it's pretty um, harrowing. And at one point, I, um, our vehicle is stoned in Nasiriya. Those of you who recall Iraqi history, it was um, where uh, private first class Jessica Lynch um, was kidnapped and she was raped. And at that time, to President Banda's point, I was completely um, second guessing my life and I was holding a, a card from my son Andrew and it said mom I love you because you take such good care of me and I'm thinking I'm not going to be able to do that anymore but I went there because I felt it was my obligation to help the INC set up a communication operation and despite all of the craziness <coughs> once I got there after 13 hours it was a remarkable period in history in that chapter um, defines that and it closed with a meeting with uh, Ahmed Chalabi and his famous quote, which he says so many times, which is that um, he quotes Winston Churchill, he did, Chalabi passed um, last year, he says that the Americans, gosh, I don't remember it, Americans will, Francis, what is it again? <laughs> it's something like that that will eventually do the right thing after trying every other poor option something like that anyway that was um iraq any liberia questions please <laughs> i'm a college student here in the washington dc area and choosing the hero is one of the most meaningful books that I've read, and I mean that with great sincerity. Um, um, my question is, um, my question is as follows: um, What do you think is particularly important for future gen for future generations to take to heart and to understand and to believe regarding the mess the main messages of the book, and why? Okay. Do you want to take that? Um. I'll take that. Be what you want to be. Set your course. Stick with it. Do not be distracted by whatever you face. Stay on course. And I think that's the best message. It will take courage. It will take commitment. It will take stamina. But if you stay on course, you'll get where you want to be. I wanted to uh, remind people that one of Madam President's uh, most uh, quotable quotes is that if your dreams don't scare you, they aren't big enough. And I think that that's probably one of the, um, you know, one of the quotes. And I and I think that I would just I would just. Uh, Second, that is just to just to persevere, and even when you think that everything's just as bad as it can get, just know that uh, there's always an opportunity to uh, to reach out and to and to and to step back up. So, there you go. Hi. Hello. Um, my name is Rachel, and I've spent the past nine years living in Uganda and Kenya, working with journalists, uh, helping them to tell development stories, but. The reason I wanted to come here today is the importance of female role models for, in particular for young African women who through a, a nexus of culture and tradition and, and so many things that keep them from aspiring to reach this level. I'm breathless here because I'm just feeling the history in the room. But I would love to have you speak to the need for perhaps more mentoring, networks, whatever it will take to have a young African female in our lifetime and even children's lifetime be able to see and aspire to be 
in the position of you two women? You know, I can't say enough for networking. Networking defined as reaching out, getting to know others, understanding their culture, their tradition, identifying common causes, and working together. And I can tell you, in this room, you know, I'm going to dare point out a few people who've done this and done this so successfully in my own life story. Uh, Debbie's one of them. Uh, Vivian's one of them. Uh, Joyce is one of them. Uh, Betsy's one of them. There's so, so many of them that have been a part of this. And what they've done is to be able to bring together, particularly young people, and to talk about a world of people having shared values, a world of being able to work together in unity. And so I would say to all the young black women, college women, don't just stay in the cocoon of where you are. Reach out. Maybe be a little bit courageous like, like Riva. Go abroad. Do something in some other place. It may, it may be sacrificial to do it. Uh, it may take a lot on your part, but go out. I'm glad you talk about you are in Uganda and Kenya. That's great experience that you had. I wish you'd take that experience and share it with people in Alabama, <laughs> Florida. Florida, you know, uh, places where places where perhaps they will not even be able to identify where Uganda is, where Kenya is. And I think if you can inspire other, other young, you know, young uh, African Americans uh, to do some of the things you've done and share your experience, I think you'll find that that will be enriching for them. Steve Landy, Manchester Trade. Great honor to be here with history. If both of you have a different view in terms of the future, if you had the opportunity to be with our new president, what advice would you give them? We are passing Mr. Bush, who, uh, President Bush, who did a great job with PEPFAR, with Millennium Challenge. I cannot go through the many programs that President Obama had with Power Africa, certainly the assistance during the health challenge in Liberia. But what advice would you give the new president as far as how he should, what, what should be his legacy? <laughs> what advice would you give my presidential choice in, in terms of what she will do? Thank you. I've got a, I've got a two-word answer. Be presidential. I've got nothing to add. <laughs> Good evening, Madam President and um, Ms. Riva. Um, my name is Jermaine Dunn. And I would like to ask a question about um, current politics in Liberia. Uh, my question has to do um, with, I'd like to ask Madam President for her comments um, on uh, recent bribery allegations with respect to um, senior um, people in the leg legislature and um, other officials. Um, this, um, these allegations having been reported by Global Witness, a um, well-known international nonprofit organization. Thank you. There's nothing more to it than what you said. <clears throat> There's a report from an international NGO. That report makes certain allegations, as you rightly said. We have asked our Ministry of Justice to look into it. They have determined 
that there's some people that need to be indicted so that they can be able to defend themselves in keeping with the rule of law. That's it. It's just a question of being able to ensure that we follow the rule of law, that they have an opportunity, they're, they're innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. That's what our law says. That's the law that we're following. There's no more to it than that. So I think we have about time for one more, one more question than how appropriate. David Smith of The Guardian. <laughs> yes, David Smith of The Guardian, hello. Actually, just uh, going back a couple of questions back to, to US politics. Um, what were your own experiences trying to become the first uh, female, or, or the challenges trying to become the first female president in, in Africa? And do you have any advice for Hillary Clinton trying to become the first female president in the US? <laughs> Um, I think she's on the right road. Um, I don't think anyone aspiring to be President of the United States um, needs any particular advice, I think. I think they live in a different environment. Um, they have to respond to a different constituency. Um, there are commonalities in uh, the objectives of leadership, particularly as we live in a in a global in a global village these days, and I think to any of them aspiring will need to know that the United States is not an island unto itself, and that they've got to be able to be a part of of this changing global world that's very inclusive. So. I would not be the one to give advice, it'd be you. <laughs> so uh, I, I've been asked that, that question before by, by someone else, and maybe since I think this is the last question, I just want to return back to my um, afterward. And, and my comment when that was asked to me, Madam, was to s the advice that you gave to me, which is um, follow your heart and do not fear being misunderstood. So that was the way I answered that question. But I think we're done. <laughs> Thank you again.